One thing about Maria Sakri, she's gonna lose early in a Grand Slam. Hey, my name is Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. Now, before I start this video, really quick, do not mind my background, y'all. I am graduating, so I'm moving my stuff. I'm talking to you, where's baby 7783? I know you're about to make a shady comment about my room. Please, I'm graduating, not too much. Anyways, 14-time Rolling Garros champion Rafael Nadal possibly played his last ever match at Rolling Garros yesterday against Alexander Zverev, falling with a score of 6-3, 7-6, 6-3. Rafa had multiple opportunities, honestly, to make this match even more competitive. He was up 5-3, 30 15 in the second set on Zverev serve, but Sasha literally hit two aces back to back to get himself out of trouble. And that was really the story of the match the Zverev serve um, just coming in clutch. And then as well, the forehand, too, especially that forehand down the line was a really clutch shot for him and a much improved shot. And at the end of the day, that's why got him the edge in those tight moments. I honestly could delve deeper into the tactical aspects of things and how overall Zverev did a better job of just being in control of a lot of the baseline exchanges. But this result merely boils down to the German being in better form than Rafa coming into this tournament. Zverev, of course, won Rome and is perhaps the favorite to win the title at the moment. And he's playing like it. He played amazing. He looked great out there. And then looking at Nadal, all things considered, Rafa, with his minimal match prep, looked good out there as well. And he honestly would have beaten probably 80, 85% or more of the field with that performance today. But he just got really, really, really bad luck in playing Sasha today in the opening round of Rolling Garros. This loss marks a few firsts for Nadal. It's the first time that Rafa has lost first round at the French, and it's the first time that he's ever lost back-to-back -back matches on clay, which shows you just how you know dominant he's been on this surface. There's also a few last on the line, most notably. Um, this might have been Nadal's last ever match at the French, and we honestly an unknown of whether this is indeed the last time that we'll see Rafa compete at Roland Garros. This match honestly didn't necessarily give me that vibe, despite you know all the, the star-studded people in the in the crowd, including Iga, Novak, and even Akras, Carlos. I just didn't feel that this was his last go at it, you know. Also, the kit didn't give final Grand Slam or final ever French Open outfit, to be honest. This thing just gives me Andy Murray, Australian Open 2019 vibes where, you know, people thought it was going to be his last tournament there and ended up, and he ended up playing, you know, five years longer. So I feel like this could definitely be the case here with Rafa. Now, the greats often don't have glorious endings, I'm afraid. You know, Serena lost in anticlimactic fashion at the US Open. Federer lost his last ever match, you know, at the Lever Cup in a heartbreaking doubles tiebreak alongside Nadal. And then I lost my last ever college match, 7-5 in the third set, after serving for the match, you know, so... You know, the greats, <laughs> anyways, it's definitely up and down for Nadal physically. He says that he's been feeling good the last two weeks, and he would have been good to keep continuing to compete this tournament had he won today. However, the issue arises when that inevitable time comes where Rafa, you know, suffers another injury setback, which sidelines him for months to years at a time. The true question is if Nadal can handle this and... To be honest, it seems like his body might be saying enough is enough. Rafa described the situation perfectly in the press when he said, My body has been a jungle for two years. You don't know what to expect. I wake up one day and I find a snake biting me, another a tiger. Perhaps Rafa can have his happy ending at the Olympics, which is in a couple months, and will be held here where you know the French Open is typically played. I don't know if he plans on playing doubles with Alcaraz or singles or both, you know. Um, but he did say that he is doubtful that he'll compete at Wimbledon, you know, with the transition from clay to grass back to clay being pretty difficult for him, especially. I think the next time that we will see Rafa out on court professionally will be, you know, in a couple of months in July for the Hamburg 500, which is two weeks before Paris, the Olympics start on July 27th. And that Hamburg 500 tournament is a clay court tournament, which is why I said it's likely the next time we'll see him. Now, moving on to, you know, the other aspects of the tournament, the biggest upset thus far on either side, rankings-wise, is 16th Maria Sakri falling to 89th ranked Vavara Gracheva, 3-6, 6-4, Maria had just beaten Gracheva a couple weeks ago in Rome, 6-2, 6-2. But, you know, a Sakri upset is never a surprise in a slam. I predicted that Sakri would lose before the second week, and I proved one of my viewers wrong. And I'm talking to you, Constantine. 
you know, it's insane that Maria has remained top 10, you know, for the past two years. And that's in a stretch where she has not performed well at all in the slams. In fact, she hasn't made a slam second week since the 2022 Australian Open, which is crazy. And I truly do wonder if her time her slim opening of winning a major has closed and i think the best chance of that for her definitely was 2021 where she made two slam semifinals and i think the loss that probably will still haunt her is the semifinal against krichigova here at the french where she held multiple match points but just was not able to come through giving her grace this is her first major with her new coach david witt so maybe it will take time you know plus krichigova still is a solid player and she had the full French crowd behind her, which definitely helped her get over the finish line. Another big blow to the draw is Beatrice Haddad Maya losing to Italian Elisabetta Cochereto 3 6 6 4 6 1. Haddad Maya made the semifinals here last year, so that's 720 points gone for the Brazilian. This opens up Coco Golf's section a bit as Haddad Maya would have been Golf's round of 16 opponent. Coco, by the way, got a convincing 6-1, 6-1 win over Julia Avdiva and placed 2021 semifinalist Tamara Zdenzek in the next round. Igor Svantec also claimed a straightforward victory, beating Leolia Jonjon 6-1, 6-2. The world number one now faces Naomi Osaka in a blockbuster second round affair. And I honestly think Naomi does have a solid shot at making this one a bit competitive and maybe taking a set, but I still favor Iga in the end as she's far more comfortable on the dirt. As I predicted in my draw preview, Iga would not have to face a seed, at least until the quarterfinals, as Veronica Kudomertova, Babora Krachikova, and Ekaterina Alexandrova all lost in straight sets in the first round. Just insane. Marquette Van Drusova, Anstra Berg, Elena Ostapenko, Daniel Collins, and Jasmine Paulini, meanwhile, all won their first round matches in straight sets. Elena Svitolina got the best match. Elena Svitolina got the best win of the day on the women's side when she eliminated former world number one Carolina Pushkova, 3-6-6-4-6-2. Canadian Bianca Andreescu made her return to the tour today, getting a great straight sets win over Sara Cerebus Tormo. She has not played since August 2023 at the Canadian Open, so great effort from her playing and beating, you know, a tough clay court grinder in Cerebus Tormo. Up next for Bianca is Anna Kalinskaya, who got an edgy 7-6, 7-5 win over Clara Burrell. Kalinskaya is one half of tennis's new power couple as Yannick Sinner confirmed that the two are dating in his post-match press conference. This wasn't too much of a shock because there was that Gazetta article that brought this to our attention, and then Eagle Eye tennis fans caught that Anna was calling calling Yannick on his phone. And then people took pictures of them out eating and talking with one another on the tennis court here in Roland Garros, so it was pretty clear. These two have been going in on the hard launch as Anna supported Yannick in his match earlier when he played Chris Eubanks, and then Sinner returned the favor, which was cute. I actually am a fan of these tennis power couples because I feel like they definitely give added interest to the sport. Speaking of tennis power couples, Stefano Tsitsipas and Paolo Badosa are back together and are partnering to compete in mixed doubles here at Roland Garros. The two broke up less than a month ago, but Tsitsipas confirmed to Greek news outlet SDNA that the two are back together. Tsitsipas said that he was the one who initiated the split due to the pressures of the tour, but he said that Badosa is his person. I honestly thought that this relationship was just a sham when they started it a year ago, but you know, it seems like it's legit. It reminds me of Gail and Alina, how like they have the ups and downs and honestly was skeptical of that relationship at first. But, you know, here they are married for, I think, two years now. I actually think that Stefanos and Paula might last. I am looking forward to seeing them play mixed doubles too. They were supposed to play with one another at one wooden last year, but Paula once again got injured. Here's to hoping that the same does not happen here because Lord knows that girl's body is made of glass. Anyways, there have not been any massive upsets on the men's side here, although it was not a good day for Chile tennis fans. Both Nicolas Jarry and Alejandro Tobilo were bounced by Corentin Mute and Zizo Bergs, respectively, and both men went very deep in Rome, so that was a bit of a shock. Jarry's loss opens things up for Sinner, who he would have played in the round of 16. Two of the three French seeds, Hugo Humbert and Arthur Fils, bit the dust in the opening round, but Gael Monfils did notch an excellent win over Thiago Seabrook-Wield, setting up a second round clash with Lorenzo Musetti. The top ranked American men have done well so far as Tommy Paul, Ben Charlton, Sebi Corda, and Francis Tiafo all progressed to round two. Tiafo had to earn his ticket into the second round, being pushed to five sets by 173rd ranked qualifier Mattia Bellucci. 
this was a crucial mega break win for Big Foe, I feel. He'd been struggling a lot lately, and the guy he played, Bellucci, had actually never won a match on the main tour. Francis is, though, going to have to step it up big time when he plays Denis Shapovalov in round two. Thinking about the other seeds, Russians to know Medvedev, Andrei Rublev, and Karen Hatchinov all got through their matches. Tsitsipas cruised past Marton Fuksovic in three sets and faces Daniel Altmaier, who beat Sander here last year. Looking ahead to day three, Novak Djokovic will start his title defense against Pierre Rouge Herbert. Arena Sabalenka and Elena Robakina, meanwhile, open their campaigns on Shai Trier and Longland, respectively. That's all I have for this video, and let me know in the comments whether you believe that we will see Rafa here once again playing Roland Garros, or do you believe that ship has sailed? Also, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post new content. Honestly, I don't know when that will be. As I mentioned earlier, I am graduating, so this week is going to be hectic, but I'm going to try my best for y'all. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Christian, and I'll see y'all next time here on Christian's Court.